In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Prasnikam. You know, someone rightly commented and said, if you want to understand the New Testament, if you want to understand the story of the Bible, what we call this meta-narrative beginning with Adam and Eve and culminating in the second coming of Christ, you have to properly understand the book of Genesis. And in particular, you have to understand what happened in the pre-fallen world with Adam and Eve. When we see Adam and Eve in the pre-fallen world, there's a misunderstanding among people that Adam and Eve ate the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and this is why they fell. This is not actually why they fell. In fact, the Holy Fathers tell us that Adam and Eve were much like teenagers. They were immature and undeveloped, but that their development and their maturation reaching its, its culmination, they would have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and their eyes would have been opened, and they would have known good and evil. And they would have seen these things, and it would not have caused them to fall or to be corrupted by the enticement of sin. That's the interesting part. What happened, obviously, we all know, is that in the immature state that they were in, they were tempted by the devil. And not just tempted in a way that was for something. It's a very specific temptation from the devil. And what is the temptation of the devil? He says what? You will be like God. You will be like God. In fact, if you actually look at all of the pagan religions of the world, and especially the occult and other practices, you see that all of kind of human uh, religions or history is kind of drawing people to this idea that they, based on something that they do, are going to become like God. In fact, when you look at something like astrology, what is it? It's the understanding that you're going to elevate your mind, that you're going to know the future, that you're going to know things are going to happen so that you can alleviate all fear and depression and anxiety because what? You have the future under wraps. You know what's going to happen. What about all this kind of new age mysticism that we see in Hollywood today, which is about what? Projecting, projecting success on yourself. This kind of positive thinking, but... It's even more than that. You see it with celebrities. They talk about manifesting, manifesting a destiny. All of these things are what? To elevate man beyond what he naturally is. Man is created in the image of God. He grows into his likeness. And the culmination of that is deification. But deification happens through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Man participates in this by purifying himself of the passions, but it is ultimately God who bestows the Holy Spirit in the measure according to each man's effort and according to what he will do. The problem with man is that man doesn't want to wait for God. Man wants to take this for himself. Man wants to kind of supersede God's path of repentance, and we want to kind of skip ahead and get to the point where everything is good where we have good health and we have lots of money and all things kind of fall in line with how we desire our life to be, etc., etc. And in fact, much of modern Christianity is, is God being more painted as a genie than anything else. A lot of modern Christianity is kind of you rubbing the genie and then the genie granting you the wishes that you want for your life. Oh, I want success, or I want money, or I want this, or I want a child, or I want this whatever it is, and you kind of, prayer is seen as kind of not a relationship, but almost as borderline like an expectation. Well, if I rub the genie, he should answer me, he should provide these things for me. And that's, in fact, why you see so many people who are disappointed in the Christian life when they view God in this manner, thinking that God kind of owes them something, or that God is going to hear every want or desire or whim that they have and that they're going to get what they want out of life and that their life is going to be fulfilling and they're not going to have problems and they're not going to, you know, uh, it's so interesting because every time I talk to somebody who wants money, what do they really want? They really want security and stability, but what is it that they really want? They don't want God. They don't want day-to-day -day living. They don't want to live paycheck to paycheck. They don't want to live in the present 
relying on God to provide for them. They want to make sure everything is tucked away in a comfortable way so that they're able to kind of go on with their life. And so it is man in this inclination is what? To glorify himself, to make himself more than he is. In fact, when we look at the Garden of Eden, the temptation is from the devil, and then who do Adam and Eve emulate? They emulate the devil. When we actually look at our own lives, in our own thirst and lust for glory and power and all of these things, we actually find what? We're emulating the devil. And in fact, when you look at the nation of Israel, there's a point where God says, I will rule you as your king. And what do they say? No. We want to be like the other nations. We want our own king. The irony is what? They don't want a heavenly king. They want an earthly king. They want an earthly ruler. And in fact, you can see that this understanding of the Messiah for the Jewish people is all about the coming of a great and powerful Messiah who rides into Jerusalem and basically takes it back from the Romans and frees the Jews, and then they crush their enemies. And for what? Not for the glory of God. That's the irony. It's not for the glory of God. It's for their own glory. That's the life that they want. They want to grab this glory for themselves. And so it is that as we begin Passion Week, we have our king, we have, in a sense, our fighter who's entering into the arena, and how does he come? You know, when you think about this, anybody watch modern fighting? You know, you watch UFC or boxing or something, right? And what are all the entrances about, right? It's all about, it's all about the height. It's about the music, the dazzle, the fireworks, the explosion, the costumes. Some guys are wearing like full costumes and like suits of armor and all this sort of stuff. It's like insanity, right? But the whole idea is what? You have your fighter and he's getting everybody hyped up for this, you know? I think about this, forgive me, but I think about this. There was a, there was a fight with Conor McGregor in Ireland and they had Sinead O'Connor like sing the entrance song and he came out and it's like goosebumps. It's like crazy. Everyone goes and it's like quiet and then it just builds and it's this crescendo and everyone goes nuts, right? And then what do we have in the church? We're like, this is God of the universe. He's sitting on a donkey. He comes. Not on the war horse, right? That's what the people wanted. The people wanted the war horse. They wanted the commander. They wanted the battle. They wanted to strike down the enemies. They wanted to see some heads roll. That's what they wanted. And instead, they get the creator of the entire universe who comes not from some quote-unquote great lineage or this or that or power or might, no military prowess, a man who's born, you, could, you can definitely say in his time, in scandal. He's got a mother who claims that she's ever virgin, that she's virgin. His, his, his stepdad never, you know, essentially marries her, right? He's her protector. They have no more children. He's a carpenter. Then he travels around. He's doing miracles. All of his miracles are what? Upsetting and ruffling the feather of the Pharisees. He's opposing the religious class. His disciples are what? Blue-collar, stinky fishermen. They're not educated. They're not religious class. They don't have money. They have nothing. I mean, these are like, everything about this story is like, it's kind of like a, wah, wah, like it's like, oh man, like this is it? This is, this is it? This is what we get? The one who created the ages? The one who spoke the universe into existence? And then he comes in all humility. It's so interesting because in our day, people think that they're successful based on the things that they do and quote unquote the accomplishments that they make and all this sort of stuff. And yet we have the complete opposite imagery in Christ. You know, by all kind of worldly standards, Christ is a failure. He is not successful. 
He's not big. He's not, he's not, he's not big. He's not muscular. He's not a warrior. He's not on the war horse. He doesn't have throngs of people following him. He's not, but he's not really, honestly, very much liked by all of the quote unquote upstanding higher echelon members of the Jewish community. He's like reject, he's rejected by his own people and, and it culminates at the end of this week. And so it is, brothers and sisters, that when we see today what we see, we should not have the thought that our lives should be something different than what Christ showed us. That's the sermon today. All of human history testifies to the struggle for power and for glory. Every great nation tried to become greater by what? Conquering other lands, subjugating people, getting slaves, dominion over other lives, expanding the empire. Every single struggle in human existence has been to capture more and yet Christ, who has everything, condescends to nothingness. I think in our modern day, there's this kind of idea, and it isn't, it isn't false, but that there's kind of an evil in our society, an evil in our world, you know, whatever you want to call it. People are like, oh, in the government, it's a deep state, which is just a bunch of multi-decade you know, decade employees, really. I mean, that's really what that is, just people who have long-term jobs and job stability, and they're not in and out of office. You have completely corrupted government on both sides. You know, you have all these different things, and they look at all this injustice in the world, and in our society, people like don't even really have much of a voice anymore, and then they're like, oh, what am I going to do in the face of all this? And it's like, you're going to be humble, like Christ. You're going to live a normal life. You're going to live what's normal in an abnormal world. What does that mean? It means that we don't come here to do great and miraculous things, to change all of society, to change the culture. We're going to take it back. We're going to do all these grandiose things. What did St. Silouan say? He said he wanted to change the world by one. He just wanted to change himself. And the great irony he is, in the repentance of St. Silouan, we still read about his life a hundred years later. We still name our children after him. We still have his icons. We see who he is. There's been so many revolutionaries in the last hundred years, so many people who are quote-unquote trying to change the world, and 99% of it is probably for their own glory, if we're being honest. Maybe it's 100, but we can't say that. And yet, what do we have as Christians? We have the example, the emulation of the life of Christ. The life of Christ is that humility is what wins. Taking the low path is what wins. Being normal in an abnormal world is what wins. You know, so many people want to change all of society and they don't even have a good marriage. It's like if you can't change your own marriage or fix that or have a healthy, loving marriage, how are you going to change society? So many people are struggling in the battle today, even in our own church, raising our children and all this. What does that tell us? What does that tell us? It tells us that the devil is warring against us. Why is the war devil warring against us if what we're doing is insignificant? It's because it's not insignificant. You know, people have these ideas about being public figures or personalities or like making a change and doing all this stuff and none of that is necessary. The only thing that's necessary is purifying our own hearts, finding our prayer, finding our repentance, loving our spouses, cultivating our children. If that is all we do with our life, we will see an endless stream of spiritual warfare against us. The devil will continually attack us because in our culture it is so dark that even if your light is not all that bright, it's so much brighter than the darkness that surrounds us. 
It's not about creating something grandiose. And that's where I think people miss the, 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 the storyline. It's about the humility of Christ. Christ changed all of human history. And yet in his own time, he was what? He was just seen as like nothing. Maybe at best another prophet. But by the Jews, he was seen as a blasphemer, trying to claim that he was God. And they murdered him for that. Nobody thought that his name would be proclaimed over 2,000 years later, except maybe his disciples. Think about that. That is our calling, is to see Christ, the example that he sets forth, particularly in today's gospel. This is not a rah-rah about winning our country back or winning back politics. Lord have mercy. Somebody wrote on, 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 on Twitter the other day, if Trump doesn't get elected, like, this is the end of our nation or something like this. And it's like, buddy, come on. Like, you know, like, God's, you know, like God's mercy is, is stifled. Like, his judgment is stifled by whether or not Trump gets elected. I mean, the guy, this, like a man who says he doesn't even need the forgiveness of God. Like the most blasphemous thing that you can say that you don't need God's forgiveness. All of our country's history rests on that? Come on, like you've lost your mind. You've lost the narrative. You have no idea what you're talking about. Our country, our life, the world around us rests on our repentance. And how deep we press in to the life of humility and the simple life the simple family life of having a family, having a spouse, having a children, enacting change in our own life. If this wasn't the case, the devil would leave us alone and nobody in the church would be struggling. But the fact that we struggle is the sign that the devil is active against the hard work that people are trying to accomplish. And this warfare, this is not to our detriment, right? The warfare is a sign that things are going well. Somebody said to me, Father, I have all these things in my life going on. When I come to church, I want to come to a peaceful place. I'm like, that's not the church. You can be peaceful in the church, but you can't expect a war zone to be what? You know, a, a, a neutral zone. The more that we see the devil active and working against us, this is a good sign. This is a good sign. When the devil leaves us alone, it's what? We've been defeated. You don't press into your enemy when they're already knocked out on the ground. You don't keep hitting them, right? They're already knocked out. When you feel the blows, when you feel the sting, when you see the warfare, when you see the things that are happening, this is because people are actively engaged in the fight. And so it is, brothers and sisters, I encourage you with the image, the model of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in all humility took back Jerusalem in the spiritual sense of the word, destroyed death, overthrew the devil, rescued us from the slavery of the devil and brought us into the beginning of eternal life that we may taste it first in this life and then in the age to come. May we have this image of humility in our minds, this great condescension that we have to participate in if we are going to be considered Christ's own children. If we are going to be considered his flock, we must suffer like the master. May we take up and gird ourselves in a manful way, see the struggle that's laid out before us, know that temptations are going to come until our very last breath, but may we continue to press in to the fight instead of running away from it or being defeated, but rely on our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy name, the intercessions of the Mother of God and of all the saints. Amen.